like to welcome you to the place. This is the place for intellectual, spiritual, and scriptural honesty. It's not the place of yet. We're simply moving in that direction. This morning I would like to deal with various things. I asked many people this morning, does Jesus really want us to pay more attention? Does he want us to pay more attention to his resurrection than each other? I want you to think about that for a moment. Does he want you to pay more attention to the event of his resurrection than to each other? I wrote something this morning. I thought that it might come together well for the teaching. Jesus made the statement, I am the resurrection. And when he made this statement, he made it well before he was crucified. Well before this event called the resurrection. What does it mean, I am the resurrection? When we analyze the Greek text and take it actually back into Aramaic, when he says, I am the resurrection, it's simply saying, I am the awakening. I want you to think about that for a moment. Because he started waking us up the day that he showed us his humanity. Keep in mind that humanity is the likeness of him. Our humanity is, is his likeness. And there's something about our likeness to him that is the image of our likeness to him that is so, so, so meaningful and powerful. Maybe you can handle this and maybe you can't. Many of you guys are here for the first time and you're going to have to understand that various things need to be put on the table of discussion because this day normally is celebrated as a victory day. Jesus is alive. That is in regards to the crucifixion. I guess my point concerning the crucifixion is this, and I keep asking this question over and over again. When is it ever moral to put someone on, on a torture stake with a cross member? When is it ever moral to do something like that? In other words, if sweet Jesus knocked on your door this week and he said, the only way that my father will forgive you is for you to kill me, to crucify me. Could you do it? Does that seem sane to you? Now, please understand the Jews didn't want to take responsibility for the action. They had the Romans do it. So the question would be, they were trying to keep within, certainly, their idea concerning law because they didn't want liability. But nevertheless, they were the ones who were crying out, crucify him. The day that Jesus went to court, they didn't find anything wrong. They didn't find him guilty of anything. And yet at the same time, we find people of theology crying out, we can't stand him, better put, crucify him, get rid of him. Put him on a torture stake, which is symbolic of saying he is damned of God. You need to ask yourself questions like this. The one who raised the dead, the one who turned the water into wine, the one who actually fed the multitudes, healed the sick, bowed down before us and started washing our feet. Is that the one that we can actually say, yeah, we need to crucify that one? I don't think so. The Apostle Paul challenges the entire story of the crucifixion by his remarks in 1 Corinthians. He said, if the rulers of this age had have understood the wisdom of God, they would have never, 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 never crucified Jesus. And so he's indicating to us that the wisdom of God 
has no room for crucifixion. And I would assume that people in 2013 would also say that it's never good, righteous, to crucify anyone. However, historical Christianity has left us with this conundrum in a sense. It has left us with the idea that our sins could not be taken away unless we crucify God's Son. I disagree with that. I disagree with our sins needed to be taken, taken away in a theological sense. So many people are arguing if we don't have our sins taken away, God's going to pour out his wrath on us. And that brings up another problem. The problem is we have an angry God who is not for us, but who is against us. And so the question really is, do we really want to spend any time, effort, or money on someone who wants to pour his wrath out on us unless someone is crucified? Hopefully we are sane enough to say no to that kind of morality, to that kind of justice. I like how Paul puts things. He treats God like he is actually love. He even tells us that love doesn't even keep a record of wrongs. If that's true, love is justice, not crucifixion. Love is kind. Love is patient. This is why Jesus came along and he said, you've heard it stated, love your neighbors but hate your enemies? That should trouble you. But I tell you something differently. In other words, it's completely different than the Mosaic law. I'm telling you to love your neighbors and also to love your enemies reason that I'm making some of these statements has to do with someone very special in our lives, and that would be my father. He was born in 1931, on this very day. When I woke up this morning, I said, God, do you want me to pay more attention and focus more on you? that on trying to celebrate the birth of my father and possibly my mother, my wife, and my children, my aunts, my uncles? Does God want me to be so intoxicated with him? I love you. It's only him. It's only him. It's only God. Or does he want me to be more in the horizontal position of loving? I find that not all of the writers, but some of the writers of the Bible actually give us the idea that it's much better to have this love for one another. For if you do not have love for one another, you really don't have God's love. However, there is a model of theology that says we have to put God first He's above all things. He's the Almighty. He's, he's worthy of our worship, and we should say, Alleluia, you know, 24-7, 365 days out of every year. I'm not willing to do that. My earthly father never wanted me to worship him. And it finally clicked that a good father would never want me to get on my knees and bow down before him. There's something extremely troubling about a theology that says that we need to get on our knees and start worshiping our Father, which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. I'm talking about change because Jesus came 2,000 years ago not to become a human sacrifice, that was the concept of Judaism. They cried out, crucify him. That is not in concert with the wisdom of God. They wanted to kill him. They tried to trap him in various places, and he escaped. But at some point, he said, I'm going to lay down my life. 
Not that dying is good, but I'm going to prove how you should react to your enemies when they abuse you. When they beat him, he didn't strike back. Yet at the same time, so many people will argue and fuss and fight. By his stripes, we were healed. I beg to differ with you. Jesus was healing people before anyone ever beat him. Before he ever bled, he was blessing, comforting people. So it didn't take this death of Christ to deal with our inadequacies. Jesus wasn't interested in becoming a human sacrifice, that is, to duplicate the doctrines of paganism to satisfy a maniacal father somewhere. Jesus was wanting us to feel good about ourselves. He was actually trying to wake us up. He did a very good job. I'm, I'm going to play a tape of my father. That is one of the last conversations that I had with my father during a show. And it was in the last few years of his life that he started waking up. And please understand that resurrection is an awakening. And so at some point in your life, maybe you can hear the good news of what Jesus did. That is his message. That is his life. And you can see that he is more interested in waking you up than anything else. Let's play the clip. So you've come a long way in your theology. In other words, you were raised in a system and taught by a man who believed that he was, you know, he acted like he was raised in hell or born and lived there. And now you don't even believe in hell. And essentially, you really don't even believe that your grandchildren need to get saved before you can say that they can go to heaven. Is that correct? Yeah, I believe they need to get saved. In what sense? Well, they need to get saved from this theology, this character that's going around. Uh, I agree with you. <laughs> they really do. I mean, this, this, this is some of the worst stuff I ever heard. And uh, the more I listen to it, the worse it sounds. So you don't think we ought to stone people for picking up firewood on the Sabbath? <clears throat> well... No, I, I think that probably went out when I was a kid, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Those people don't pick up firewood I did when I was a kid. <clears throat> and my daddy would whip me if I didn't. <laughs> so he didn't stone me, but he... <laughs> he didn't stone <laughs> Okay. Jesus. Did he come here 2,000 years ago because his father was so angry and resented mankind and he was holding on to all of these records of wrongs? Did Jesus come along and atone for our sins or did he do something different? You know, you go back to the islands, <clears throat> some of these islands where I've been, and uh, well, you could even go to, to Hawaii. And there's still people that go up on the mountain there and they offer up offerings and sacrifices and praise and stuff, trying to appease angry gods. Well, uh, that's paganism. You can come up with all kinds of stories if you believe in Trinity theology. But when you realize that Jesus 
is the Father because the book says his name shall be called Everlasting Father. We don't have an angry God that's upset. Now, first of all, if the writing is true, that he doesn't keep a record of wrongs according to 13 of 1 Corinthians, uh, what's he got to be angry about? That's true. And if he don't have anything to be angry about, he's not, he's not, and God doesn't, he doesn't go around, you know, with, with this, carrying this, this anger like man does. He doesn't do that. <clears throat> and so, no, Jesus did not have to, have to shed blood to take care of that because if God never remembered a man's transgression or his sin, then why would there have to be an atonement made for it? In other words, if you don't hold a record of wrongs or keep a record of wrongs, in fact, he says he doesn't even want to be reminded of it. He will not remember our sins. He's not into that. What he's into is actually helping his created children. And so what would be the necessity of atonement? What would be the necessity of propitiation is what you're suggesting. Yeah, well, you know, he said it, that in the Hebrew that... Uh, uh, you made these sacrifices and offerings to me. And he said, I never asked them. And, and he said, though the law demanded them, he said, I didn't like them. I didn't want them. What does that suggest about the law? That suggests it was a lie. It, God is saying, you're out here teaching that you got to offer up a billy goat or, or a sheep <laughs> and, uh, you know, to get rid of your sins. And uh, I never asked for that, and, and I wasn't pleased with it. Nobody can tell me that you can go out here, commit sins, and then chop a goat's head off, and then be all right. I mean, why would, why would anybody believe stuff like that? So you're saying that God's not pleased with the death of Christ that isn't taking care of our sins. That's not the issue. I think that in the death of Jesus, there was at least two things accomplished. One was, by his death, the scripture said, greater love hath no man than this, than to lay his life down for his friends. I think that Jesus showed us how much he loved us. Second, I think that through his death, that he literally abolished the law. Now, if that's what you want to follow, is a law that condemns you all the time you live and can't help you when you need help, and then <clears throat> kills you. But here's a God that gives you life eternal and helps you in every way. And then people say, oh, give us the law, give us the law, take us back to the law. I think people got brain damage. <laughs> I agree with you. What would you tell your great, 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 great grandchildren? right now if you could share with them a message that you'd like to live to uh, till you come along <laughs> <laughs> that would be wonderful that would be wonderful but what do we want to give our great 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 grandchildren what do we need to give them it would be nice if we could give them a bible that was a Bible about God and the truth about God instead of just stories that somebody's made up or carried down through history or these things. And I'm not trying to belittle what men have done, but I am saying that I think that there is a, a lot of misguided people representing God throughout the Old Testament. My father woke up 
he started realizing that God wasn't like others suggested. You know, when you fall in love with someone, just to hear the words brings tears, tears of joy. I miss my father. But I realize that I'm not a person without hope. Some people are still taking communion today, and I think it's very unfortunate. Jesus, he had this supper with his disciples, and he talked about the wine, he talked about the bread. And it was a very simple thing. He wanted to connect with them, to give them the courage to be like he was. He knew that if they carried his message, those people in theology would kill them. He even said, listen, when you go into these different, you know, various cities and preach the good news, they're not going to like you. He wasn't painting theological systems as systems that really can embrace change. He wasn't painting theology as a system that says, wow, we can accept truth. He wasn't painting theology like that. So in a sense, when he took some wine and he said, you know, I want you to analyze this. Look at it. This is my blood. I want you to look at the bread. This is my body. It's going to be broken, but the same thing is going to happen to you. But you need to remember, you need to keep doing this to keep me in your mind until I come back to you. He kept emphasizing over and over and over again to these individuals. He said, you need a comforter. You need someone who can comfort you, not just you. But those people in theology, they need a comforter. That's exactly what they needed. But the people who they were ministering to were stuck in fixed belief, if you will. They, they grew up thinking that every year they needed atonement. They needed a Passover. But when you look at the historical evidence, when Jesus came out of the tomb, it wasn't like, you know, all the guys were there clapping and saying, wow, this is wonderful. No, the report is a woman found this to be the case first. And it's even recorded that a woman found this to be the case. Now that brings various questions into my mind because in their kind of theology, they would never esteem the word of a woman, that is, value the word of a woman in this con kind of context. They would have had it established, that is, through the means of men, not women. And so this, in a sense, gives them an escape if, if something goes wrong. And this troubles me because, you know, they don't mind putting the women out there just in case we're wrong about this. And this is why you have very little, and it, it, it's troubling, very little about what is stated in between the resurrection and the ascension. You know, most of the disciples are asking questions like, you know, the very ones who killed you, Jesus, are you going to restore the kingdom back to them now? now that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, does it? Why would you restore a kingdom back to a group of people who are out to crucify someone healing the sick, raising the dead, feeding the hungry. 
someone as gentle as Jesus. I guess my point is, Jesus didn't come into the world to save the world. That's offensive to most people when they hear me say, Jesus wasn't the savior of the world, not in the classical setting or sense of savior. You know, he, he made statements like this, and I love these statements. These statements are compassionate. These statements are filled full of kindness and patience. He was talking and he was talking to some theological driven people at one particular time and he said, "Listen, you know, you guys are righteous, but the sick need a physician." For a physician when he looks at sickness, he doesn't condemn the patient. He has wonderful bedside manners and yet he's going to do everything that he can to heal the patient. Jesus didn't come and say, well, you know, God is against you. He's here to damn you, and he's having an anger fit. He's not talking about this God of wrath at all. In fact, he's talking about something that's quite different. He's suggesting a complete paradigm change. I wrote this down this morning. I thought that it may help. And this may shock some of you. Write this down if you would. I'm walking away from God. I am. I'm walking away from God to follow Christ. That's exactly what Jesus was doing. Let me continue to read. I'm walking away from God to follow Christ, for in him there is life. That is life without a theology of death. In him we can get rid of the notions of theisms that belittle our humanity. I want you to listen to that. We can get rid of the notions of theism that belittle our humanity. Think about what humanity is. In other words, for the image of his likeness is his masterpiece. In other words, are we the image of his likeness? Yes. Is that his masterpiece? Yes. In him we can accept and love without conditions met. In other words, we're capable of accepting each other. We're capable of loving one another unconditionally. Anytime that you put a condition on love, it will fail. Anytime that you put a condition on acceptance, if I, if I tell my wife, listen, honey, I, I, I can't accept you unless you meet certain conditions. I can't love you until you meet certain conditions. If I tell my children, listen, you're not my children. I'm not going to accept you as my children unless you meet certain prerequisites. No, my children, my wife, everyone around me needs to know that they are loved and accepted unconditionally. It brings them the much-needed security that they need. Jesus came to give us that sense of safety. He wanted us to feel secure. You see, good parents want their children to feel very secure about who they are. Good parents want us to feel very secure about who they are with their parents. Good parents don't allow distance to come between the parent and the child. However, in the theology that Jesus walked right into, there was much distance. You're away from God. Every time that you sin, you've broken all of the commandments. In other words, if I'm guilty of one sin, I'm guilty of the entire law, and that separates you completely from God. That is 
Catholic and Protestant theology. Did Jesus advocate that mindset? Not at all. In him we can accept and love without conditions met. In him we can live and move and have our being. I want you to think about that. This is the very thing that Paul told those people there on Mars Hill. In him we live and move and we have our being. What, what was he doing? He wasn't taking one particular quote out of some uh, sacred text somewhere. He was actually quoting from the poets. For he emptied himself of modeling God as the distant one. Once again, I'm walking away from God to follow Christ. I'm not interested in following concepts of theology that suggest that there's a difference between God and humanity. I like what Jim Palmer said. If we can erase those lines that divide God and humanity, we're much better off. What is humanity? What is divinity? If you have those two separated, then you really don't know the real Christ. In fact, Paul puts it like this. He said that you are in Christ, and Christ is in you. Put that together. Put that together. It's, it's simple. Look in the mirror when you get up in the morning and say, you know, I'm, I'm created in the image of God. And just as Jesus walked the face of the earth and was God, I have just as much of God in me as Jesus had in him. I'm just as much a part of the body of Christ as he is part of the body of Christ. I'm just as much a part of the body of Christ as Paul or anyone else. I am important. Once you start feeling as if you are important, you are actually waking up to what Christ wanted us or the position that he wanted us to be in. In other words, I am the resurrection equals I am the one I am uh, the one who awakens you. So it's about the awakening. This is not about getting saved. You don't need to get saved unless you're in a burning building. Now it's true that a physician will save our lives, but that's a completely different kind of salvation, isn't it? When I tell people Jesus didn't save us, I'm not suggesting that healing isn't a salvation. But I'm simply saying that I deny all aspects of a salvation that suggests that I need to be saved from God or hell or anything of that nature or from my sins so I can have a good relationship with God. No, what I need, I need that physician who knows how to heal my illnesses. And in the process of being healed, I need to have one who is willing to comfort me, one who has wonderful bedside manners. That's the real God. You know, sometimes we get wrapped up in days like this. We call it Easter. Some people call it resurrection morning. Historically, when you look at the evidence, you don't see these people saying, well, next year, Jesus, since you, you know, were, you became alive, we're going to celebrate this next year. And then the next year, we're going to have celebration number two. And then the next year, we will have Easter number three. That's not the way that it went. This Resurrection Sunday, as we practice today came from those people who are more interested in holy days than they are in you waking up to who he is. You don't need a holy day. You need to realize who you are in him 
and who he is in you. That's what you need. You need to wake up. You need to look in the mirror and say, God is in me. That's simple. I'm in him. This has nothing at all to do with whether you believe it or not. This is not an issue of whether you're an atheist or a theist. It doesn't have anything at all to do with that. It's just who we are. We are human beings created in the image of God, period. It's sweet. It's wonderful. It's something that we should be able to embrace. So the question is, did Paul teach that Jesus came 2,000 years ago to die on a cross so that he can take away all of our sins so we can be with God? No, not at all. For he didn't concentrate on the event itself. He came and preached Jesus Christ and him crucified, not pertaining to the event, but pertaining to the mystery itself. The mystery itself deals with that which took place back before time began. We were blessed with every spiritual blessing in every heavenly place. In other words, we're blessed before time began. And then he chooses us for himself. He's madly in love with us. And so he chooses all of us for himself because this is a passionate God. This is a God who has always been in love with you and me. And so Paul spends at least two chapters just describing this passion that God has towards us. And Paul comes along in chapter 3 of the book of Ephesians and tells us up until this time in history, we didn't know it. We must have been asleep. But when Jesus came, the very first day that he became a human being, he started waking people up. Look at the child play. He's only, what, 10, 8, 9, 12, 15? What is he doing? God things are just... Is he just being amazing? This is why Jesus, when he was walking with the disciples, he says, listen, guys, greater things are you going to do than what I've been doing. He's trying to say, you can do much better than I did. He's not saying, I need to die for your sins so the wrath of God won't come against you. No, he's saying... Yes, there's coming a day in which you're going to do greater things than what I'm doing now. And I'm doing wonderful things. I have a lot of confidence. That's something that you guys lack, confidence. So many times we are taught that we need to have faith in God. You know... I like to look at believing like this. If you tell me something, I, I might react to it. I might trust it. So in that sense, my trust is almost like a reaction. And it's subject to change as the facts are presented. And so I'm not stuck in my belief I don't want to stay there. What I want to do is I want to keep moving forward. I want to investigate. I want to explore facts for what they are. And at some point, I think that we can start grasping that God wants us to have this kind of confidence that gives us the ability to actually do greater things than he did. I don't think that he was spinning hyperbole. He's simply saying, you can do better than I'm doing right now. But unfortunately, religion would have you feel there's no one better, no one greater than Jesus. He's done the finished work, and you can't do anything better. That wasn't his message. His message was, 
not become like me. His message was more in line of, let me look at a child. You see this child become like that child. Don't be so biased. Open your mind. Be willing to learn. What am I presenting? I'm presenting good news. The good news is you're just fine with God. If you don't feel that way, it simply means you need to wake up. You don't need to get saved. You just need to open up your eyes and explore how wonderful your Father is. He's good. Whatever God has made you, whatever God has made you feel condemned, walk away from that God. Whatever God has made you feel insecure or made you feel like you're going to hell or anything like that, just walk away from that God. That God is a myth. Follow Christ. He's, he's not over there. He's in you. Ephesians 4 simply says he's the father of us all. He's working through us all. He's in all. It's that simple. What was the purpose of the resurrection? I don't think that Paul was so caught up with the details of the event. In fact, the event itself have very few things that we can see that is in the context of evidence. But what we do see that is in the text itself, we find the evidence of him being the resurrection. That is the one who is the awakening. So I hope that this will help you. Wake up. Things are much better than what you can perceive right now, possibly. Tomorrow can be a better day than today. The next day can be a much better day. Start being positive about life. Don't feel like every year I need to celebrate Easter so I can celebrate the event of the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus was more interested in changing our behavior than in dying and rising again. He simply came back to life to simply say, they killed me, they murdered me, but I'm not going to leave you nor forsake you. Be secure. The purpose of the resurrection was to give me security, something that I could put my teeth into. I need security. Human beings need to be secure in their own skin. I didn't need someone to come and say, hey, listen, You've done something wrong, and I'm going to take away your responsibility concerning your wrongs. No, I, I don't need that. I need to own up to my own problems. If I have problems, please correct me. This is why I like one writer of the New Testament. He said, love actually corrects. See, the doctrines of penal substitution suggest this. You don't have to own up to anything. Just trust Jesus, and all of that stuff is just wiped clean. You don't have to be responsible or accountable to anything. There's something radically wrong about that kind of parenting when you just say to your children, you don't need to be corrected. See, a good father will say, no, you need to be corrected. You need to mature. Here is how you mature. Jesus didn't come along and say, listen, I came to wipe the slate clean. No, he didn't do that. He taught day by day, week by week, month by month, how to change, how to have better behavior. He wants us to learn how to have the better life. The resurrection is about waking up to what life really is. And in that, we can live and move and actually have our being. Thank you for your time.